Welcome to this edition of Free Speak, a podcast of the Namibia Media Trust. I'm Gwen Lister, hosting this edition of the NMT's Free Speak podcast, and Graham and Martha are my guests today. How can we ensure that people have both greater say as well as insight in our national budget? The Open Budget Survey is a global indicator which measures and compares transparency, public participation, and oversight of the budget process in 117 countries worldwide. The Institute for Public Policy Research, headed by Graham Hopwood, conducted the 2019 research in Namibia, and this shows that we've improved slightly in transparency as fourth best in Africa, behind South Africa, Ghana, and Uganda. Yes, I mean, first of all, we score relatively well on the transparency index, which means that we do produce a lot of information about our budget. But we've done poorly in the public participation part of the survey, as researcher Martha Nangolo elaborates. So we scored zero out of 100 in terms of our public participation, um, and the score hasn't changed since the previous 2017 OBS survey ranking. The upshot is that more needs to be done to engage the public on the budget and to ensure greater access to information prior to its approval and also during hearings and audit reports. Graham, in the open budget survey uh, for 2019, uh, Namibia did reasonably well in one respect, but not so great in another. I wonder if you could address how we did fairly decently and Martha, if you would take up where we fell short. Um, yes, I mean, first of all, we score relatively well on the transparency index, which means that we do produce a lot of information about our budget, and it is available online so people can access it. Um, so we get a kind of middling score there. Um, we're 47th on the global rankings, which is kind of in the middle, and we get a 51 out of 100 score as well. Um, the problem, I think, is that we've been at this level for quite a number of years and have not really been making advances. Um, but um, in terms of the, the volume, volume of information, we, we produce several large documents like this one yeah. um, when the budget is tabled in Parliament. And you can see, I mean, it's, uh, it's just pages and pages of numbers um, and tables. Um, which is good in the sense of the detail is there, but it's not good in the sense of accessibility because right. unless you're an experienced economist or a journalist who's really interested in these issues, very few people are going to plow through this kind of document. And as I say, there's about five or six documents published like this every budget. Yeah. Um, not all of them quite as large as that, but you know, they're, they're pretty intimidating even as PDFs on a website. So um, what the Open Budget Survey is trying to do is saying to the governments around the world, try and make this information more easily digestible, uh, easy to access, easy to read. And if you look at the countries that are well above others in the rankings, they tend actually to produce more documents, but smaller documents that are well designed, very clear and easy to read, and uh, no kind of jargon or, or strange sort of phrases that most people won't recognize. And um, that will help the public to engage and understand the budget. And okay, you might say, well, why is the budget important? But you know, you've got to think, every year we're supposed to pass a appropriation act, which is the budget. It's at least 60 billion of Namibian dollars, which is public money, taxpayers' money every year that's um, spent by government. So we should really take a very close interest in this. I mean, it actually shows what government's priorities are. Government in a speech might say our priorities are this, but you might find when you look at where the money is going, for example, on defense security, that actually it's, um, it's not maybe health so much, it's more defense and security as an example. So, you know, we all need to engage much more closely, but we need the kind of documentation and material that we can easily understand and digest as well. Exactly. Maybe just to follow up on that, Graham, if one does do as you say, and we make uh, obviously shorter praises of what's happening in the budget to make that more accessible to a wider population, 
does that not incur huge cost, especially at a time when the budget has perhaps not yet or has just been tabled and is perhaps subject to change? Uh, what do you think on that? Is it, is it really feasible to do all that uh, summarising, if you like, uh, prior to the fact of its actual adoption? I think the Ministry of Finance will probably have done a lot of this work okay. anyway. They okay. just have, have got a presentation issue really of how to present right. the budget. Okay. What we find in Namibia is that we have this three-year rolling budget called the Median Term Expenditure Framework. And what we, you see in these documents is every year they just copy and paste the figures in, you know, put them back a year or whatever. And w another issue which is you know, they're not thinking about this expenditure, so they're not thinking uh, is it actually worth us building a new Ministry of Home Affairs building, for example? Yeah, yeah. Should we rather spend that on something right. that will, a welfare initiative that will help people on the ground, right. or some kind of initiative that will produce jobs? Um, and uh, I think that's where we go wrong. We don't do enough of the cost benefit analyses, but also just analysis of, you know, do we actually need to keep this, uh, this item in the budget every year until it's fully spent? If you remember a few years ago, they were proposing a, a new a new parliament, and I can't remember the figure, but was it yes. several several Absolutely. billion Namibian yeah. dollars anyway? Absolutely. And actually, yes. that was one example where we can say the public got did get engaged. Absolutely. It was pointed out in the media, and because of public protest, they took it out of the budget. Otherwise, we would have seen that money just being spent, and we, you know, we would have said, well, it's a waste. Why did we need that? We could have spent it on something better. But um, so that's an example of how we can engage more on these kind of issues right. and actually right. affect the budget. Um, the funny thing about Namibia is that because I suppose we have one party that's dominant, we hardly ever change the budget during the budget debate in Parliament. Right. It's almost exactly the same document that comes out, that comes out when it's tabled. <laughs> yeah. Graham, thanks for that. Uh, Martha, I wonder, in the same survey, um, Graham's just dealt with how we did reasonably well. Um, uh, we, did, we scored a zero in one respect. Can you elaborate a little bit as to how and why that happened? So we scored zero out of 100 in terms of our public participation. Um, and the score hasn't changed since the previous 2017 OBS survey ranking. And um, the reason th this is is because of the understanding of what public participation is. Um, public participation is um, the engagement of citizens in the planning, the implementation, the approval, as well as looking at um, the audits that the Auditor General does. And um, one of the misconceptions that we've had, even from IPPR, uh, consulting with the Minister of Finance is that their definition of public participation is a minister going to a few um, uh, events that have been organized by NMT or IPPR, which is not OB, uh, the IBP's definition of what public participation is. It's about the government, central government, or the legislature, or uh, the Auditor General creating a platform for um, citizens to engage, whether it be through public hearings, whether it be through uh, e-consultation, um, Minister of Finance or uh, the legislature, for instance, having e-polls, asking citizens what their um, inputs are on various issues, and looking at the priorities that are on the ground. For instance, um, more people feel, and this is according to a study that we were actually part of um, a year ago, that Namibians feel that government should spend more money on health as well as education of which because of what we're going through right now that we can see why that is a need. Um, so public participation is um, where is the level of engagement that citizens, both me and you and anyone on the streets, um, involvement in the in, into the budget in terms of inputs of whether they want their priorities or whether they are um, whether they're disputing what it is that government has put on the table and they don't want that. Graham gave two examples of, for instance, the building of, um, of home affairs or the, uh, the planned, what is this, um, parliament building, right. of which it could have been avoided had we had consultations in, an earlier, in, in an earlier period. Another thing could also be that Ministry of Finance could go out and have uh, public, he uh, not hearings, but what is this, these town hall meetings. Town hall meetings, yes. Yeah. So, what the so th th that's one of the biggest issues. And we're going to continue scoring zero out of 100 if the ministry or the legislature or the Auditor General does not incorporate um, citizens into these um, discussions.
Okay, so that's an area that really is a priority it's, to be worked on it is. for the next survey, which I gather is then 2022. It's normally every 20, two years, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. Okay. Um, Great, maybe I can just chip in there and ask you, so the fact that we um, sort of fairly stuck on this position for the last few years, obviously our president in particular has been promising more transparency, more open governance uh, for some time now. Does that say that we're kind of stuck and that we're not making much progress forward to transparency or...? Um, what we've found globally is that the standards have been going up, particularly okay. since 2009, uh, global economic crisis, yeah. when it was found that some governments around the world, the world were kind of fooling themselves and fooling their publics by producing false figures on the debt they owed, right. and Greece being the example in Europe. Um, so there was a push for more transparency um, nationally but also internationally. Um, so the standards have been going up. So Namibia has done some of the right things. Right. So in the last five years we introduced a medium um, a medium year review of the budget, usually in October or November, okay. to see how we're doing and to plan ahead and to modulate and change if we need to do. Um, and then we also introduced a citizen's budget, which is a very basic guide, which Martha will talk about. But um, right. So we made two advances in terms of the documents we're supposed to produce, sure. but it didn't change our score too much because other countries were moving much quicker than us and much faster than us, which is actually the experience on several different right. types of international indices that we're measured on. Yeah. You know, for, it's the same on improving the business environment. We might do one or two tinkering things, but we're not moving anywhere as fast as other countries in terms of uh, making it easy to invest, for example. So um, what we found is we're basically just middling, you know, in, in, and not making much progress. Mm. So, you know, there is a gap between the rhetoric and what happens on the ground. And we want to see that closed. And there's a number of practical measures that can be done, which they might cost a bit of money, but yes, at the end of the day, yes. we might also cut out waste and make our spending more efficient. Absolutely. So the idea of you know, consulting and maybe producing more documents might seem an initial cost and might take up time, but it will produce better results in the end. Right. I'll uh, get back to that on the question of access to information, but before I do, Martha, since Graves mentioned it already, this citizen's budget, um, how do we explain to people what is it precisely? Is it a sort of the ideal bu uh, budget of, of civil society mm -hmm. or what is it and how does that, when we bring that out, have any kind of impact or resonance mm -hmm. with the government as they sit and look over the real world? Yeah. I think we've mentioned already that, you know, um, we, we, the Ministry of Finance produces five of those huge documents yes. and they're very, very technical right. and um, have a lot of economic and financial jargon. Now, um, this is actually a citizen's budget and it's produced uh, with five different vernacular languages as well. And what it does, is it simplifies um, the document that it's explaining. For instance, our citizen's budget um, simplifies our EBP, which is Executive Budget Proposal, which which is the estimates, the revenues, et cetera, et cetera. And it makes it simpler for me and you to understand that maybe, right. for instance, don't have an economic or financial background. And um, It's important to say also that this, um, they, the Ministry of Finance produces this and they've inserted it in all the newspapers, yes, I think. Yes, they do. Oh, they that's do. So, um, the newspaper yeah, so yeah. it gets, it's basically a, a, an explanation in a couple of pages, of, of you know, including the different languages right. of what's, yeah. The main points there should be used here. Well, a couple right. of charts, charts. and our graphs, yeah. Right. Um, so it is a good initiative, um, and uh, we need the government to build on this. Yeah, to, to, to do more in terms of also um, informing and educating right. the, the, the populace. Right. Um, and a, a good way could be uh, by uh, improving, by providing civic education, financial literacy, for instance, to inform citizens on how to participate, um, what they should look out for. As Graham said, we're looking about 60 plus billion. In people need to be informed about these issues. And if people don't have an understanding of what's going on in our budgets, how are they, how are they then going to know um, what to then attack in terms of priorities? If government says our priority is, for instance, I don't know, NDF, and we say, no, it's not NDF, it's health or education. Exactly. Um, that's, that's an opportunity for then government to then be able to explain that to citizens by using simple documents like these to further get that message out. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense, but what I'm seeing is, okay, so we'll have this citizen's budget mm -hmm. and I'm not sure whether that's released at the same time or... It is, it is. At, at so, the same time um, that the budget is being discussed. So, 
Maybe what's missing, Graham, here is perhaps a look at, because people will read that and access it, but it probably still does involve a lot of numbers crunching and big figures. Mm -hmm. So how do we take that one step further and say to people, okay, how do you make a judgment about whether the defense ministry should get X amount or the national intelligence mm -hmm. service as opposed to poverty reduction? How do we move from the citizen's budget to actually bringing it down to the nitty gritty of those main and often controversial expenditures? Yeah. That's where civil society and the media yeah. come in. To, um, uh, we can break it down and explain it. Okay, um, if you look at this portion of the budget, that could be so many houses built, exactly. so many new clinics, classrooms. Yeah. So there is a responsibility, which probably government isn't going to do. Um, so we need to you know, play our role as um, public actors and, and break things down for people to see. So you know, it's really great when you see the newspapers say, okay, the, this, this m amount of money is being spent on this building. It's the equivalent of so many low-cost housing in, uh, units. Right. Or it's the equivalent of so many new classrooms uh, in a particular area of the country. Exactly. So if, if we can do that more and more, I think the public will get an understanding. I mean, one of the huge projects, which um, again was multi-billion, was the Neckatal Dam. Absolutely. We still don't really know, and we, none of, nobody produced a convincing report to say this is definitely what we need. Uh, we might be proved wrong, but obviously there are a lot of skeptics about that. And if it is wrong, we've wasted a huge, huge amount of money. So, you know, we need to know from the start, really, are these projects worth doing? And would it really not be better to do something that might bring more immediate benefits to, you know, many of the population who are struggling. Exactly. Mm. Gwen, if I may add, I, I think it's, I, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a misunderstanding from the public side that they don't have a right to, to discuss these issues, right. which is completely wrong. Exactly. In fact, our constitution, Article 95, which is principles of state policy, actually permits us to be involved in, 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 in consultations with government on issues like this. Um, and I think people would only do that if they felt they were comfortable enough in terms of speaking the language and if they had more platforms that actually in, encourage this type of thing. I know that, for instance, organizations like NMT and, and IPPR and H HSF and whatnot, they do do this. But we need to have every all the players, as Graham is saying, on at the table. Media, for instance, we need to have them. Um, I know that one, one of the one of the tools, a good example would be Twitter, having a poll to say, do you think we should um, spend this amount on this specific sector, right. uh, which will then give this amount of results in that, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, a very good, uh, another issue that we would have talked about was the expansion of the port in, 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 in what is this, in Wallfish Bay. What does that mean for our economy? Exactly. Government needs to be able to explain, okay, this would mean that would open our gates, this would increase right. our revenues, et cetera, et cetera. And we don't, we don't see that type of engagement. It's only from one part um, of which, yes, media does give out the information, but how do they give it out? Yes, civil society does talk about it, but are we actually simplifying it for a teacher or um, a street vendor on the streets to actually understand and exactly. are we having those discussions with different vernacular languages because if we're not then it defeats the purpose. Definitely and also what Martha now says Graham the fact that access to information in terms of these sort of big subjects um, will obviously enhance public participation right in the processes. Now, as we all know, we've been sitting with the issue of an ATI law yes. uh, for the promises thereof for the last couple of years, and it's not happened yet. How, Graham, do you think could something like this access to budget be written into the uh, or guaranteed in the ATI law? Is there a place in there to emphasise exactly this this um, question? There may be a possibility of saying, you know, all, all information relevant to uh, uh, the spending of government money should should be available. Um, but I, I, my hope with the access to information law is that, although it's a, a law that can be used, you know, and somebody could approach an access to information commissioner and get a piece of information, we shouldn't really have to do that with any of this kind of material, which is should be in the public domain. So my hope is that more that it changes the culture around um, in government that civil servants become proactive mm -hmm. in terms of releasing information mm -hmm. instead of being defensive. So often when we ask the Ministry of Finance, why is this not on the website? Why is this document not available? They're sometimes quite defensive, aren't they? And mm -hmm. they don't understand um, you know, that their role is to be proactive with information. 
and also to change the culture within the public that they know that they can expect to be able to right. to get this kind of if they want detail they can have it but if they want to a simpler accessible breakdown they can also get it right. so I'm hoping that that will uh, the law is, will be a technical thing but will also help to change the culture in Namibia in terms of people's expectations and government officials in terms of what they think their role is exactly yeah I think Thanks, both of you might but just to chip in here with a we in the moment in the midst of this global uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, our budget has been postponed uh, because obviously Parliament isn't sitting yet. Um, why is this process even more important at a time like this? It's more important because of accountability, right. Gwen. Um, we need to know what government is spending on, how much they're spending right. on, and if they're spending it well. And okay. this is where um, citizens would then be involved and in encouraged into pushing, not, I don't want to say pushing, but kind of encouraging government to have that, those discussions to say, okay, fine, we have proposed we're going to spend this amount of billions on the COVID-19 doing this, this, and this, and that. We've seen around the world, it's not only in Africa or Namibia, right. that there, there's a lack of um, ventilators. So for instance, if government then puts up a proposal to say, no, we're going to only spend this amount of, on masks and medication, what about the ventilators what yeah. happens if and this is an opportunity where um, citizens can then come in and say okay listen this is I want to see what's what you're spending the money on and I want to be right. able to then also give an input I think where the ATI could also come into that respect as well is that for instance especially with the legislature at this point is having um, citizens coming into giving testimonies right. uh, this would be a good opportunity to inform our le uh, our um, our legislature on what the people themselves want and maybe to give them new ideas as well as opposed to just doing whatever it is that they do without having any... I think that we accept that we have a public health emergency at the moment. Exactly. Of course, of course. There may be possibilities using technology to consult, yes, but um, obviously we can't have a public meeting of more, you right. know, more than 10 people. So right. it's a bit limited and we are... And at the moment what's happening is we haven't got a budget. We haven't got That's a 2021 20, yes. budget. And what the happening, is happening is the Minister of Finance is using the State Finance Act to allow him to spend the same levels as the previous budget for several months up until the end of July. Certain portion. Um, but that's not, we understand why it's in place and he does need to move quickly yeah. so he can basically order expenditure by directive exactly. published in the, in the regulations in the Government Gazette. And we understand why that is. It was important to introduce the emergency income grant quickly. Exactly. And to be fair, government's done a pretty good job on that. I mm. mean, yeah. I was, it actually shows how quickly government can act because they managed to roll it out within about 10 days. Absolutely. But you know, the, in the medium to longer term, mm. we still need to go back to the democratic practice. So we, many parliaments are already operating around the world who are in a worse situation than exactly. us, using technology and social distancing. So we need to see our National Assembly back in action as soon as yeah. possible. Okay. And it's possible that they will still uh, table a budget before the end of this month. Okay. And then we'll be back more into you know, a situation where we can scrutinize we can comment and contribute, and hopefully by next year, 21-22 budget, we could talk more about, can you please now just at least pilot a scheme where you do some more consultations and public hearings. So, um, you know, I think we accept that it's difficult at the moment, but government can do certain things. But, you know, we should plan this for the next budget. Exactly. Yeah. Greg, can I pick out on one aspect of the current uh, pandemic, which is of course the thing that's been very controversial in some ways, um, but welcome in, in many others, and that has been that 750 grant um, that's been given out. And now, I think there seems to be a lot of controversy about how and who are the recipients of this grant, because you hear all these huge figures, so many applied, so many have been turned down, so many have got the grant. Uh, those sort of things are critical, aren't they? For actually understanding whether we have the system to implement something like that properly and how you decide whether or see whether somebody else is recipient of other grants mm. and um, like old age pensions, for example, or whether you are on the taxpayer list. What do you think about this? At the end of the day, are we going to, with hindsight, uh, have to unpack how this process was undertaken and who decided who got and who didn't? I think it is providing a test case to yeah. see whether maybe at some point in the future we could um, have a more regular grant or a basic income grant. Okay. Um, 
for me, it's shown that it is possible, and it is possible to do things quite quickly using technology. And the private sector has assisted here with, you know, with MTC and MobiPay and others. Um, so it's actually quite a hopeful initiative. And I'm quite encouraged. I know people don't like the fact that 350,000 people have not been maybe rejected, but on uh, having their applications reviewed, because at least it does show the Ministry of Finance is looking very closely at this and is trying to weed out those fraudulent applicants. Right. You know, I think it's, um, it's a good initiative, which we, but we will need to review it very carefully right. and see um, you know, where things might have worked and where they went wrong. So and again, it's part of this accountability. You know, we right. need to know, did this work and could it work in the future? if we have similar situations or if we want to reform our welfare system right, exactly. and find a more efficient way of delivering money to people. Absolutely. The general view these days is that cash grants are the ones that do the most good um, rather than food aid and things which you know you can already see tensions in certain communities about people feeling they're not uh, getting their fair share or whatever so um, you know we do need to definitely uh, review this very carefully. Exactly, and that's exactly the process mm. that we're talking about must happen around the budgets. I know I've got a very particular uh, feeling about uh, this whole grant question. And my mm. issue is, and it may not be workable, but that is to, to, to really have a database of unemployed people in Namibia, a proper database, which can be obviously updated when people get jobs or mm. move out of that unemployed sector and then do away with things like the orphans grant and the veterans grant, keep obviously the old age pensions and put everybody who is unemployed on a straight up unemployment grant. I think this process may have showed us it's possible it is for possible. us to do that. But maybe just to, to start wrapping up Graham and Martha, can any of you or either of you think of examples where over the past couple of years had there been more public participation in the budget that certain mis-expenditures or wrong appropriations could have been avoided? Just to bring it down to the nitty-gritty, where would public participation in the budget have really made a difference? Can you think of any examples around that? Well, obviously, I mentioned that Parliament was the one Parliament example and where, itself, for example. Um, yeah. you know, we know an initiative was actually stopped through public pressure. So uh, that's an example. I think what we need to do a lot more carefully is look at all the capital projects. Yeah. A lot of money is spent on, on buildings and new infrastructure. And um, that's why I mentioned the Ministry of Home Affairs, because okay. it's the most glaring, huge building. But that's there's a lot of ministerial buildings and office accommodation for government that's being uh, built around the capital and also outside yes. and um, at the same time we know and the president has said we have to downsize the civil service mm. we cannot afford it anymore so why are we building more and more lavish offices so that's an example where you know i think there probably has been waste and we and the wrong priorities so one of the things that i hope would come out of a more serious citizen engagement with the budget is a reorientation of the budget towards what has been said before to have a pro-poor budget so exactly. sh shift a lot of the expenditure away from uh, wasteful and probably pointless projects right. um, and and make that available um, for welfare for very uh, initiatives in, in communities at the grassroots right. level that will right. really help people and um, that's where we need a change in mindset and uh, we can we to do that we'll have to engage with the, the numbers and the figures and understand them and say well okay why are you spending it here and not here so um, it's a, it's a big piece of work which a lot of stakeholders need to be involved with but right. the starting point would be to have engagement with accessible budget information exactly yeah and also as you say it's the it's the power of example the one you've just mentioned of the Home Affairs building. I mean, when I drive past there and I see this hugely massive edifice mm. going up, and mm. then um, you juxtapose that against, you know, schools in the north which are falling apart and all over the country for that matter. And you, th those are the, the types of examples I think that people can identify with. Yeah. But maybe just to, to tie up, unfortunately, we're running out of time, and that is to say the one word we haven't mentioned here in this discussion has been corruption. So Graham and Martha, perhaps as you make your final remarks, can this um, open budget uh, survey have impact corruption? 
uh, in one way or another. Perhaps as you make your final remarks, just just give some mention of that. Martha, go ahead. Um, definitely. Um, when we look at, for instance, procurement, just the procurement system as, as, a, as a whole, um, where we encourage people to participate in looking at the documents that government takes out and scrutinizing what it is that government spends on right. and questioning whether or not that is a reality on the ground um, and seeing the results of that. Um, corruption is as a result of uh, misappropriation or a lack of information. That's that's all a ho that, that creates a hostile environment where it eventually uh, grows. So I think um, the OBS does give light to that um, in bringing people on board and having more accountability mm -hmm. in the process. When there are more than more more than two eyes that are looking at an object, it's kind of hard for you to take it away from you not to see it. Exactly. So um, I think definitely the OBS survey is one of the tools that could help in um, fighting and combating corruption. Hopefully, I mean, this isn't, you know, the budget is important, but there's a whole load of uh, government information that we need to get access to. And this is, so for example, one of the things IPPR has been saying is we need the um, state and enterprises or public enterprises, we now call them, to be a lot more transparent. And we recently did a survey which found that most of them are way behind on their financial reporting and annual reports. Mm -hmm. And Namibia hasn't published anything for, of interest or detail on their finances for more than 10 years Absolutely. and yet it's a, so I mean I was thinking about this in terms of the fish rot um, corruption scandal for example we might not have been able to spot issues there in the budget but if fish Corps has been producing detailed financial reports so there might have been something to question there if the auditor general is looking at these uh, um, public enterprises and scrutinizing them very closely, he might have also spotted something which the public could have taken up. Similarly with the SME bank scandal. Um, if the SME bank scandal had been very clear about in their financial reports, we might also have been spotted it earlier. There was mm -hmm. something very seriously wrong here. So, you know, this, this culture, it's not just about the budget documents, but if you create a culture of releasing this information and making the detail available, then there's more chance that we can pick this up, but there's also more chance that those who want to be corrupt, who would be corrupt, will think, well, I can't really do this because mm. it could actually appear in this document. Or if somebody looks at these figures, they'll see as a discrepancy. So, you know, we, that, that's why it will help. And it will, therefore, then it acts as a deterrent to corruption. Um, people will feel, um, you know, this thing will be exposed at some point and I can't run the risk of, of well, taking this public money exactly. for myself. Yeah. And perhaps finally, just to say that you know, more access to information, especially about open budgets mm -hmm. and this process, will in turn create among Namibians the demand yes. for that information. I think this is critical. Mm -hmm. You know, we can talk about the fact that they need it to make mm -hmm. their decisions, but what we want to see is a bottom-up demand for that information in order that they have some say in their own development. So thank you both okay, for joining us today.